dive in. So this is the practice exam. So practice exam number two. When you do the one on the homework, it'll be the same exact questions. It'll just shuffle the multiple choice answers. But it'll be the same questions in the same order. So this will be your number 20 as well. And it'll literally be the same. Like it won't change the questions. It'll only change the multiple choice order of the answers. Does that make sense? It's a little less fluid. It's a little less changing than other things. So, all right. So, how are we supposed to do this? It says, refer to the data set below. Determine whether the requirements of a normal distribution is satisfied. Um, assume, you know, assume that this requirement is loose in the sense that population distribution need not be exactly normal, but it must be a distribution that is basically symmetric. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. So, in other words, what they're asking us is they're saying, hey, all these numbers right here, if you were to graph them, would they end up looking like that? You know, like normal, like a bell? Would they end up looking like a bell? Can you guys just look at those numbers and kind of picture where they would, where they would go and in your head as you, as you look at them? Can you do that? Like 28.1 and 24.0? You kind of picture. I'm sorry, I'm joking around. There's no way to picture that, right? We need to put them in the calculator, right? They're thinking, no, I can't do that. Right, no, neither can I. Nobody can do that. Well, maybe some superhuman person. But anyway, so we need the calculator to tell us if, if those numbers end up making a graph that's got a bell curve. How do we do it? I, I, this is the one thing we haven't covered in the homework. Let me show you. There's actually two ways to do it. You have two things. It's all in the calculator. First thing to do, though, before you do either one of those two ways, is put all this stuff in L1. So take out your calculator. Go to the stat mode and put all that data in one long stream down L1. The whole set of data. So, so in number 20, what the plan is. So to, to test, so to test for normally distributed data. That's what we're doing. We're saying, hey, are all these numbers going to make a bell curve? So how do you do it? How do you test for normally distributed data? Step one, put the data in L1. Step two, you um, do second stat plot, which is above y equals, above the y equals key. Step three, you'll, you'll have um, plot one, and you want to hit enter on plot one. And as you go in there, you'll have the on, off. You want to turn plot one on, and then you'll have the type of graphs. There will be six of them. You want these last two. This one, select for a bar graph, and this one, select for normal quantile plot. And here's how it works. If, it, if it's bell-shaped, then data normally distributed, and this one, if, if the dots are in a line, then the data is normally distributed. So that's it. It's basically two different tests. You can do either one. The normal quantile plot's a little more precise, but basically it's two different ways, and I'll, and I'll show you those ways on my calculator too. It's just two different ways to test if a bunch of numbers really form normally distributed data or not. You basically put all the data in L1, 
and you select the bar graph and you graph it and you look at the bars and see if they look like a bell. And then you put them in, uh, then you go down and go back in and select the sixth graph and click that. Oh, I didn't click the last thing. I'm sorry. After all that, yeah, there's, there's one last important thing. You got to hit zoom and then nine. That's really important. Don't forget that. So hit zoom. Again, zoom is in the top middle, very top. Very top middle. Hit zoom in nine and it'll graph whatever you told it to graph. What I mean is, if you selected the bar grapher, it'll graph bars. If you selected the normal quantile plot, then it'll try that. If you're graphing the bars, it should look, it should look bell shaped. If you're selecting the quantile plot, that, that the lines, the dots should form a line. That's what'll indicate whether it's actually normally distributed data or not. So not what I get when I do it is um, is a graph that sort of looks like a bunch of dots like this. They go pretty much, then they kind of break off a little bit like that. But that's close enough. So that's close enough to a straight line. We say yes, the points in the normal quantile plate exist. Oh, no, not that. Yes, the points in the normal quantile plate are close to a straight line. That is our answer. Is that good? So I, I graphed the sixth one. I, this is really the best one to graph. I gave you the other one also, but this is really the best one. I put it on that one, which is the normal quantile plot, and they came out like a straight line. Am I making sense on that? Questions on that one? <laughs> right, so these little calculators are powerful. So it'll do, it'll do, actually, you see there's six different kinds of graphs it can do there for you. Based on, they can make a bar graph, quantile graph, and all kinds of fancy little graphs. All right, question number one. Back to the beginning then. We did number 20. Now back to, there'll be, there will be 20 questions. All right, here we go. So we've done a lot of these, haven't we? You know, some kind of medical test or other test is given person has the disease, does not have the disease, positive test result, negative or test result. All right. Um, if one of the results is randomly selected, what is the probability it is a false negative? All right. So which group on there is false negative? Uh, yeah. Yeah. The four, huh? Because they got a negative result, but they really have the disease. So it's a false negative. Right, the test told them negative, you don't have the disease, but they really do. That's a false negative, right? So that's the false negative. So it's four, so the probability is going to be four out of what? Out of, yeah, what they all add up to be. I, they're not telling us, are they? we got to add them up ourselves, I guess. 122, and what's this? 176. Yeah, add those up. That'll equal, what is it? 298. 298. So 4 out of 2, because 298 is the total. So 4 false negatives out of 298 total uh, tests. So that's going to be, I'm getting point oh one three four. It wants 4 places. There it is, 0134. We good there? Like you could, you'll do that? Well, on uh, Wednesday, questions I can answer? Question two, tail below, smoking habits of a group of asthma sufferers. Um, one of the 1083 people is, ran this, time, this time they're giving us the total, that's nice. One of the 1083 people is randomly selected. Find the probability that the person is a man or a heavy smoker. So number two, they're saying man or, oh, right there, man or heavy smoker. That's what they want. All right, so what do we do? Man or heavy smoker? So th these are totals here. Let's get these out of the way. Yeah, we just add up all the groups that are men or heavy smokers, right? So who are all the men? What's the men total? Yeah, 583, which is really this plus this plus this plus this which is almost all the people we're talking about, but what else do we have to add on to that? The 40. Not the 83, 
right? Because if you added the 83, that would, that would double count this 43, wouldn't it? Everybody see that? So you just basically take this 583 and we add the 40, don't we? That'll be all the people that are men or heavy smokers. These are all the men, and these are the ones that are heavy smokers. So that'll be all out of 1083 total. So what is that? 623 out of 1083. I'm getting 0.575. There it is. Thank you. Good. Number three, manufacturing process has a 70% yield, meaning that 70% of the products are acceptable and 30% are defective. If three of the products are randomly selected, find the probability that all of them are acceptable. How are you going to recognize that? Could that be... Um, it's mentioning a percentage... Is it one of the normal ones, like normal CDF or inverse norm? No way. It never says normally distributed. See how it never says anything is normally distributed. So it's, not a, it's none of that. See how there's no normally distributed up there? So what is it? Binome. Binome, right? It's two states. They're either... They're either acceptable or not acceptable. That's a binome. See how there's just two states there? Two results. If something comes out acceptable or not acceptable. Two states. Binomial distribution. So you th will you recognize that on the exam Wednesday? <laughs> so that's, that's, that's your job is to learn to recognize that. That's binomial. So now that you know it's binomial, look on your exam notes and see if you can find how to handle that. Okay, so as we look at this, we recognize binomial. They're either acceptable or defective. That's two states. Binomial. So you look at the exam, two notes, and you go, okay, did they give me a probability distribution? No. Is it gambling or insurance? No. Is it probability, say, exactly or less than or something like that with no mean... And no standard deviation? Yeah, there's no mean here. There's no standard deviation. I don't see the words exactly, but they are asking me if three, if three of the products are randomly selected, find the probability that all three of them are acceptable. That means exactly three out of three, doesn't it? Does that make sense? If I say three out of three, I mean exactly three out of three, huh? So that would be right here. It's, it's this exact case of the binome. Right? So we're trying something out. I don't even know what we're doing here. We're uh, some manufacturing process, and it's cranking things out, and 70% of the things that come off the assembly line are good. 30% are defective. What's the chance if we get three in a row off the assembly line that all three, exactly three, out of the three will be good? That's what they're asking us, huh? The probability that exactly three out of three. How do you do that? Binome PDF. Remember, PDF is for exactly, and CDF is for all the other types. So we're going to do binome PDF. So let's go back. Oops. So it's going to be binome PDF, and then you put the number of trials, the probability, and the exact number. That's what the thing says there. Number of trials, probability, exact number. So it's binome PDF. What's the number of trials? How many times are we trying this? Three times. We're grabbing out of three. The probability each time that we're going to get a good one? 70%, right? Because 70% of all of them are good. So every time you grab one off the assembly line, there's a 70% chance it's a good one. And what exact number do we want? Three in a row that are good. Three in a row that are good. So put that into your calculator. And I'm getting point zero two seven. 
There it is. It is point three four three. You guys are totally right. I just did the wrong thing. Point three four three. That's the right answer. Which is not there. None of these, which is disturbing. Is that making sense? You getting that on your binome PDF? I'll show. So uh, another way you could do this problem, I don't know if it's helpful to show more ways to do the problem. That's what I first did when I was a brand new teacher 20-something years ago, fresh out of grad school, and I thought, I'll be so helpful. I'll show everybody like three ways to do the problems so they can have their choice, you know, whatever they like best. So everything I did, I would show like three ways to do it. People were totally confused. That's when I learned that's not helpful. Students like one way over and over and over and over again rather than, let's do it this way. Or you can do it this way. Or do this. Everybody was totally confused. Anyway, so at risk of doing that a little bit, there is one other way that you might feel is easier. It's basically an and question. You can just avoid the whole binome and just say, look, it's the chance that the first is acceptable and... The second is also acceptable, right? They said three in a row are good, right? And the third is acceptable. You could just do that, right? Because that's, um, that's what they're saying. You're going to grab three in a row off the assembly line. You want the first one good and the second one good and the third one good. Remember we learned about and and or? Uh, what's the chance the first one is acceptable? 70%. And what do we always do with and? Multiply. Multiply. Or is add... And is multiply. So you got to know that fact. It's just 0.7 times 0.7 times 0.7, which is the same exact answer. Yeah, I, I just looked down for a second and grabbed 0.3. Yeah. Either way, I've shown both. Yeah, yeah. So either way is totally good. You could just do the binome thing, or you could do the 0.7 times 0.7 times 0.7, because it is an and question. Three in a row, like that. That makes sense? Either way is good. The answer is 0.343, which is not there, which is slightly disturbing. Question four. A sample of four different calculators is randomly selected from a group containing 18 that are defective and, and 40 that have no defects. What is the probability that at least one of the calculators is defective? Everybody see it? The very last entry is directly telling you how to handle at least one. At least one. What do we do for at least one? And I gave an example. I said, for four children, what's the probability of having at least one girl? Well, the opposite of that is having no girls. So you take one minus not girl times not girl times not girl times not girl. So the way you do it is one minus... Not whatever times not whatever times not whatever times not whatever. And what is the whatever? Whatever they originally asked you. In this case, girl. In other cases, not so much. So, what is the probability that at least one of the calculators is defective? So, what is it they're asking us? At least one defective. Right? At least one defective. So, what do you do according to these rules? 1 minus not defective times not defective times not defective, etc. Does that make sense? I'll put it right here. So it's going to be 1 minus not defective times not defective. How, how many calculators? Four. So I've got to do four of these. Not defective times not defective. Four of them, because there's four calculators that we're grabbing, a sample of four. Does that make sense? That's what that at least one formula is saying. It's one minus not whatever they're asking times itself several times. Okay, so what is, what's the chance that a calculator is not defective? How are you coming up with that? Yeah. 40 out of 48? I mean, 40 out of 58? Beautiful. Right? There's 
40 that have no, in the, in the pile, there's 40 that are, are, are good. 40, let me write this over here for you. 40 that are good, no defects, right? It means they're good. And 18 that are defective. 18 bad ones, huh? So in the pile, there's 40 good ones and 18 bad ones. Add that up, that must be 58 total. There's 58 total in the pile that you're grabbing out of. So that's what they're really saying, right? You're reaching into that pile of 58 four times, and we're hoping to get a good one, good one, good one, good one, meaning not defective, not defective, not defective, not defective. Right? So what's the chance that we get one that's not defective? 18, oh no, no, 40, <laughs> we got, well, not defective means good, so 40, huh, 40 out of 58, times 40 out of 58, times 40 out of 58, times 40 out of 58, or done more easily, well, you can just do it that way if you want to, or but more easily, you can go 1 minus um, parenthesis 40 divided by 58 to the fourth power, if you want. Is that, is that confusing? Right, because there's four of them. This is the power right here. This is the power right here. So the power is the up arrow. Is that making sense? Now, if you're going to do it that way, you've got to do parenthesis. That's, that's probably going to confuse you, huh? Yeah, I'm, if you're going to do the power button, you're going to have to put parentheses around it because that way you're saying that whole fraction to the fourth power. If you skip the parentheses, it's only going to do the 58 to the fourth power, which isn't right. So the whole fraction to the fourth power. Like that. Or you could just type this in straight. This will be fine too. Either way. 0.774... Right there. So, is there not a... um, so at least one, you can do it with binome. Is it binome PDF or binome CDF? CDF, if you go back to the notes, yeah. So go back to binome. At least, there's the at least category, binome CDF. Okay. So um, if you're going to do that, it's number of trials, probability each time, and um, here's the trick, though. It's number or less. Remember how it's a little tricky? The at least stuff on the binome. I think you'd be having an easier time using that other formula I gave you. But this will work. Um, you're going to have to do binome, CDF, number of trials. How many times are we trying this? Four times. We're picking out four categories. What's the probability each time that you're going to get? What are they asking about? You want to get one that has no defect. Um, right? Oh, no. Oh, no, sorry. At least one that's defective. At least one... Yeah, see, this is probably going to confuse you. If you do it this other way, now you're, now you're trying to get one that's defective. So what's the chance that one's defective? 18 are bad out of 58, or just 18 divided by 58 is what you would need to put there. That's the probability of a defective calculator. 18 out of 58. And then you want number or less. Well, here's the real trick. This, see, this is hard. Um, remember the way they wrote the, the way they wrote that program for bi, binome CDF. Remember, I was told it's like a vending machine, right? You put in the dollar, you get out the drink. It said, "You tell me the number or less, and I'll give you the probability." Well, we don't have the number or less. We have at least one. What does at least one mean? If I say I got at least one coin in my pocket, what does that mean? One or two or three or more, huh? One or more, doesn't it? I can't put a one here because any number, the way they program, this is something you want to learn to think if you want to use technical software in any professional job. They Excel or any of those programs, they program in a certain way and you need to know how they programmed it to use to be a, a faithful user of the software. For the binome CDF, they program that last spot to be number or less. So if I put a one here, it's going to tell me the probability of one or less. That's not what I want. I want one or more. Right? I don't want one or less. I want one or more. 
Well, what do you do then? You do the opposite. Remember, that's where we learned the whole opposite thing. You say, what is the opposite of, of, of one or more? Zero. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's the opposite of one or more. It's none. Right? Say, so, do you have one or more? No. Well, what does that mean? You got none. Isn't that the opposite of one or more? The opposite of one or more is none. So you put right here the opposite, zero. Remember, whenever you're doing the binome CDF and, and your numbers go up, you need to do opposite because the programmer that put that function together in our calculator, he or she made it for numbers or less. Is that making sense? In other words, the binome CDF function only works for a string of numbers that go down to zero. How about if I say it that way? Right? Numbers that go down to zero. So I mean by less. You know, five or four or three or two or one or zero, for example. Any string of numbers going down to zero. So if you don't have a string of numbers that go down to zero, if you have a string of numbers that go up, like we do, one, two, three, that's going up. It's not going down to zero. Then you need to do the opposite. Theirs only goes down. So you put in a zero, and then you take, but that's the opposite. Then you take one minus answer at the end. That's how you do the opposite. And the way you get answer is you have to hit second and the negative button, which has answer above it. Then hit enter. So this is not simple. So I'm getting point seven seven three seven eight rounds to point seven seven four. Same answer. Question five. The table below shows the soft drinks preferences of people in three age groups. So people under 21 years of age, 40 of them prefer cola, 25 root beer, 20 lemon lime. Between 21 and 40, 35 prefer cola, 20 root beer, 30 lemon lime. Over 40, 20 prefer cola, 30 prefer root beer, 35 prefer lemon lime. Their taste buds are dead anyway by that time. I'm just kidding. That's me. I'm in that category. My kids swear I can't taste anything just because they live for sugar. All right, anyway. Um, so now um, let's answer that question. So if one of the 255 subjects is randomly selected, find the probability that the person is over 40 and drinks cola. Let me make it bigger for you here. So over 40 and drinks cola. Let's finish the question. So what's probably that um, they're over 40 and drink cola? <laughs> it's these 20 people, period. 20 out of 255. Does that make sense? The only people that are over 20 and drink cola are those 20 people out of the 255. So if you grab one of the 255 at random, the chance you're going to get people over 20 and drinking cola is whatever that is, 0. 0.078. Oh, they want the fraction? Oh, okay, that's good Good practice. So let's go back. Um, glad we, thanks for the reminder. So it's these 20 right there. So it's 20 out of 255. Yeah, how do you reduce that fraction, remember? Math, hit the math button on your TI, enter, enter. That changes it to a reduced fraction. So if you go 20 divided by 255 and then hit math, enter, enter, it'll come out four something, 51? 451sts. Or, or you could have just, yeah, di yeah, just divide top and bottom by five. Or you could just change all those to decimals. If you like, completely forget anything else, you could change them all to decimals, huh? And match it up that way, too. Yeah, all it did was divide top and bottom by five. That's right. It just divided top and bottom by five, reduced the fraction for us. There's the answer. Is that making sense on that? Six. The following table contains data from a study of two airlines which fly to small town, USA. Okay, so, um, so and what's their question? If one of the 87 flights around, so find the probably the flight selected is an upstate flight given that it was late. Let's put it here, a little bigger table. So this one number six, yeah. So this is number six. Here it is. There's the table. Find the probability it's an upstate flight given that it was late. So try that one. The whole thing is it's given, huh? Given is the issue on this one. What do we always do for given? Given is what you know for sure, right? So they're saying, hey, I'm giving you that it was a late flight. 
I just grabbed a flight at random out of the 87 flights. And let me give you this information. It was a late flight. So if you know that it was a late flight, it had to be one of those. 11 flights, didn't it? You tracking with me? See, given is what you know for sure. They're saying given it was a late flight then for sure it was one of those 11 flights. That's why given is always in the denominator, because given is, is the possibilities, isn't it? So it's got to be one of those 11 flights. So if we're talking about those 11 flights, what's the probability it was an upstate airlines flight? Yeah, that's 5 out of 11, which hopefully is one of the options. I don't know. Oh, there it is, 5 out of 11. Is that good? So remember, given is your new denominator. Huh? It's the new possibilities because that's what you're given. That's what you know for sure. <laughs> it was a late flight. <coughs> Number seven, another table. Positive, test result negative, has disease, not have disease, blah, blah, blah. What is the probability subject does not have the disease given that the test result was positive? It's another given, huh? All right, this is number seven. So, subject does not have the disease given test was positive. Give you a second there. Given. So, we're given that they had a positive test result. So, that means it was one of those folks, huh? We, the given, again, is always the denominator. And so, that is the 93 plus the 27. What's that? 120? So, out of those 120 people not have the disease, that's the 27. Out of 120, isn't it? Those givens getting easy? Let's divide that out. What do you have, 0. 0.225? And there's our answer. Easy? Questions I can answer? Here we go. Suppose that 20% of a population are infected with a certain disease. There is a test for the disease. However, the test is not completely accurate. None of these tests ever are. 90% of those who have the disease test positive. However, 4% of those who do not have the disease also test positive. It's a false positive. So a person is randomly selected and tested for the disease. What is the probability that the person has the disease, really has it, given that the test result is positive? So if they test positive for the disease... What's the chance they really do have it? It's not 100%, right? They test positive. What's the chance they've really got it? Hint, we're giving you a big old hint. This is just like the doctor's mistake. Make a table, positive, negative at the top, disease, no disease at the side. Uh, start with the total population of 1,000 is a good starting point and go from there. So remember that? So this is just, just like the doctor's one that we walked through. Can you do that? This is exactly the way it'll be on the test. I'm giving you a little help here. I'm saying make a table with positive, negative at the top. So I'm going to do a table here. And it's going to say positive, negative at the top. It, on the side, it's going to say disease and no disease. Disease and no disease. And then, suppose the total population is 1,000 people, and go from there. Where do you put the 1,000? Yeah, the lower right-hand corner. Remember that? Because that's the total of the totals, huh? Yeah, so start with 1,000 people, okay? And then you just go back up to the facts one at a time. Start with this first one. First one. <laughs> suppose that 20% of a population are infected with a disease. So what do we do? 20% of the whole population has the disease. So how many people did we assume were in our population total? We just made up 1,000 because it's a nice easy number, right? We could be talking about any size population. So we just said, hey, let's do a nice even 1,000. It would be nice to work with. 20% of that 1,000, what does of always mean? Multiply, right? Multiply. Of is always multiply. 
point twenty of times the population of a thousand. If you multiply that out, you'll get two hundred people. Twenty percent of a thousand people. Point twenty times a thousand. That's two hundred people. And where do those two hundred people go? Right there. Yeah, they have the disease. The total number that have the disease, huh? Making sense? So can we get this number? If there's a thousand people total and two hundred have the disease, how many don't have the disease? Yeah, just subtract, gotta be eight hundred, huh? Good? Now let's go for the next fact. Ninety percent of there's that of again of those who have the disease test positive. So 90%, that's 0.90, huh? Of, I'm going to multiply by something. What am I going to multiply by? Does it say 90% of the whole population? No, it's not 90% of the whole population, right? That would be 1,000. That's not what I'm going to do, right? It doesn't say 90%. Up here it did, 20% of the population were those infected. But now it's saying 90% of what? Of those who have the disease. 90% of those who have the disease. Who has the disease? The 200. It's 90% of 200, huh? Multiply that, so 180 people. 180 people. Where's that 180 go? Yeah, that's right here, isn't it? Right? 180 people out of 200 who have the disease test positive. 90% test positive. Right? Those are people that have the disease, right? They're in the, they have the disease and they test positive. So what must this number be? 20. Yeah, because 180 and 20 to make 200. Is that good? And now there's one more key fact. 4% of, of what group? Those who do not have the disease also test positive. So 4%, 0 0.04, of times, times what group? The whole population? No, not the whole population. Those who don't have the disease. 4% of those who don't. Who doesn't have the disease? The 800, huh? 4% of the 800. What's that come out? Is that 32 people? 32 people. Don't have the disease, but test positive. That's right there. No disease, test positive, huh? See how that's the no disease, test positive box? Is that good? And now, how do we get this box? Subtract 800 minus 32. That's going to be 768. And then we can add vertically. If we add these up, this will be, what, two, 212? I think if I just add this and this. Yeah. And if you add these two, it be 788. Yeah. All right, now we're ready. All that to actually answer the final question. All that setup work so that we can answer the actual question. What is the question? <coughs> what is the probability that a person has the disease given that the test result is positive. We good there? So given a positive test result, so, who we, so they're giving us the fact that the person we're talking about got a positive test result. Where are they then? Which group? Yeah, they're, they're, they're here. They're out of the 212, aren't they? The 212 people that all got a positive test result. They're one of those people. And out of that group, what's the chance that they really have the disease? 180 of those 212 people actually have the disease, right? 180 out of the 212 who tested positive actually have the disease. So divide that out. I'm getting 0 0.849. 0 0.849. There it is. Is that good? Like you could do that on the test for the big points on Wednesday? 
If a couple has three children, what's the probability they will have two girls and one boy in any order? Hint, write at all the possibilities. It's been a while since we've done this. This is one of the older things. Do you know, do you know what it's even like talking about? What does it mean, write out all the possibilities? Remember, tree, you can make a tree. And you could go, first, first kid is boy or girl. That's the, that's the first child born. The second child can then be a boy or a girl. <coughs> that's your second child. And then the third child can either be a boy or a girl. Is that good? And when you put it all together, what do you have here? Boy, boy, boy. Or boy, boy, girl. Or this would be boy, girl, boy. I'm just following the, the path, right? Boy, girl, boy. That makes sense. I'm just following the tree. This would be boy, girl, girl. And then this one will be Girl, boy, boy. This one will be girl, boy, girl. And this one will be girl, girl, boy. This one will be girl, girl, girl. So those are all the eight different things. There's eight, eight of them there, huh? Those are the eight different things that can happen when you have three kiddos. So what's the, possi- what's the probability? Two girls and one boy in any order. Two girls and one boy in any order. Well, how many of those are two girls and one boy? Here's one of them. Three. There's two of them. Here's three of them. Yeah, so it's three out of eight. Divide that in your calculator. 0.375. There it is. 0.375. Now, I'm probably, I'm totally breaking my old rule, but you could do this one another way. You could do binome again. All these really could be done with binome if you prefer. Uh, because there's just two things, huh? Boy or girl. Boy or girl. It's 50-50, 50% chance. So you could do that with binome. I, it, t- it would take forever if I do the whole thing, but real quick. You're basically saying, what's the chance we have at least one boy? Right? No. Oh, that's not right. Uh, you're saying, what's the chance I have exactly one boy? That's what, that's what we're really saying. Yeah, this might be actually not bad. You could just do the exactly one boy. Because that's what they're saying, right? One boy, two girls, any order. But it's exactly one boy. It's not two boys or three boys, or right? It's exactly one boy. So you could do the binome thing. That would actually be binome PDF. Remember PDF for exactly? And we do number of trials, probability, and then exact number. So yeah, this might actually be pretty easy. Probably totally confusing you all by showing you two ways again now. Um, number of trials, how many times are we trying? Three, three times they had kids. What's the probability each time that they're going to have a boy? Well, fit half, 0.5. And what, what's the exact number of boys they want? One boy. And then hit the buttons on your calculator, you'll get 0.375. So if you'd rather do that than draw the tree, you could totally draw that tree right on your study sheet, you know, to have for the exam, if you prefer. In a study, 44% of the adults questioned reported that their health was excellent. A researcher wishes to study the health of people living close to a nuclear power plant. Among 14 adults randomly selected from this area, only three reported that their health was excellent. Find the probability that when 14 adults are randomly selected, three or fewer are in excellent health. (coughs) Kind of confusing question, huh? Let me read that again. So in a study of 44% of adults... In a study, 40% of adults question whether their health is excellent. Should you wish to study health? Okay. Among 14 adults randomly selected from this area, only three reported that their health was excellent. Find the probability that when 14 adults are randomly selected, three or fewer are in excellent health. Ooh. Struck me before. Um, 44% of adults question reported that their health was excellent. A researcher wishes to study... What's, uh, among 14 from this area, three reported that their health was excellent. What's the, find the probability 
of getting, okay, so, yeah, I guess we're just supposed to use the 44%. Yeah, I was thinking something different. I was wrong. So just use the 44, 44% um, report that their health is excellent. So we're going to grab 14. What's the chance three or fewer are in excellent health? So binome again, huh? Excellent health or not? So it's binome. So it's binome. Now, is it PDF or CDF? How do you know? Yeah, because it's not exact. Remember, only PDF for exact. It's binome CDF. So it's going to be number of trials, probability, and um, what you put here is always number or less. Number or less. Okay, so remember the way they programmed this binome CDF. You put in here a number less. If you don't have a number or less, if you're not going down to zero then you need to do the opposite because they program this to only handle a number or less. So, um, is this going down to zero or not? Yes, it is. Three or fewer? What does that mean? Three or two or one or zero. It does go down to zero. Isn't that what three or fewer means? Three or two or one or zero. So if it goes down to zero, I don't know if I'm totally confusing you or not. So, if the options, if the options go down, meaning to zero, um, then no opposite is needed. No opposite is needed. Is that making sense? Because that's the way it was naturally programmed anyway, is to do a number or less, to go down. So if the question you're trying to answer goes down, great. You don't need to do opposite. Just use exactly what they've got there. Binome CDF, number of trials, 14, right? We're asking 14 people. What's the probability each time that their health is excellent? 44%. And number or less, we want three or less, don't we? That's, that's what three, two, one, or zero means. Three or less. Three, two, one, or zero. Hit the buttons on your calculator. Yeah, I get 0 0.073. Seven percent chance you're going to get three or less people with excellent health who say their health is excellent. I'm sorry? It's not less than three. It's three or less, which is different. Good question, Christine. Everybody seen that? Yeah, that's a good question. That would be a different thing to be less than three. So, so the way they, the way, that's why I specifically wrote here in this last spot, I didn't write less than the number. I wrote number or less because it's that number or less. That's how they specifically programmed that little subroutine. Make sense on that? We good? The brand name of a certain chain of coffee shops has a 46% recognition rate in the town of, is that Coffleton? It's almost coffee, right? Coffleton? An executive from the company wants to verify the recognition rate as the company is interested in opening a coffee shop in the town. He selects a random sample of eight Coffleton residents. Find the probability that exactly four of the eight recognize brand. That's simple, binome, exact. I'm, just gonna, I'm tired of binome here. It's another binome. It's an easy one. Is it binome PDF or CDF? PDF. PDF because it's an exact, right? Number trials, probability. It's a lot easier than those other ones we were doing. Exact because PDF is exact. So the number of trials, what is it? Eight. Eight people. Probability each time, 46%. Recognizes probably the exact number he wants for. Hit the buttons, whatever the calculator says. It's a lot of binome. I'm getting 0 0.266, or 267, I mean, it rounds. There it is. Okay, number 12. And so they're saying, they, basically they got this table about 14 newborn babies and, um, what is it? Uh, probability of girls. So what this here, let me make this table bigger here. This is number 12. So question number 12 here. They're basically giving us this table, which is the probability. So the, the chance of having zero girls out of four, if you have 14 kids, uh, if you have one kid, the chance of zero girl, 
No, no, I'm not saying that right. You have 14 kids. What's the chance you have one girl? Very low. What's the chance you have exactly two girls? Still pretty low. What's the chance you have exactly three girls? Exactly four girls? Exactly five? Exactly six? Exactly seven? Exactly eight? Exactly nine? Exactly ten girls? Etc. Etc. How are we doing there? Are we good on that table and what it's about? So that table is telling us the probability of having that number of girls. And then they ask us, what's the probability of selecting two or more girls? So two or more girls. How are we going to do two or more girls? Well, we're going to have to take this, because that's two girls, huh? Or more, three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine or ten or eleven or twelve or thirteen or fourteen. We've got to add all those up. Two or more. You've got to take out your calculator and add all those up. Or what would be easier? One minus the other stuff. Yeah. Just add the other two that are missing. Add these two up. That's easy to add up. One of them zero. Right? So it adds up to 001 and take 1 minus because it's the opposite. So it's 0.999. Done. Does that make sense? So do the opposite of 2 or more. Do 1 or 0. Add those up and then do 1 minus it. Do the opposite. We good there? So the answer is there's a 999% chance. Number 13, suppose you buy one ticket for $1 out of a lottery of 1,000 tickets where the prize for the one winning ticket is to be $500. What is your expected value? What's your expected value? So to do this problem, we'll certainly have one of these kind. You go to exam two notes, gambling or insurance. So you'll certainly have one question on the exam that's uh, gambling or insurance. How do you, how do, you do that? Well, it's telling you right here, L1, dollars win minus dollars cost to play, and negative dollars cost to play, probability winning, probability losing, in your L2 column. So let's do that. We're going to have L1, what was it? Uh, dollars win minus dollars cost. So dollars win minus dollars cost, and then the second one is negative cost to play. Negative dollars cost, and then L2 is probability winning, probability losing. Probability of winning, probability of losing. Okay, so let's do it. So L1, dollars you'll win minus the dollars cost to play. What's the dollars you'll win? You'll win $500, huh? If you have the winning ticket. You'll have $500 minus, what's the cost to play? One dollar. So notice you'll win four ninety nine, really, won't you? If you win. And in L2, what's the probability of that? What's the probability of winning? There's a 1,000 tickets. There's one winning ticket. One divided by a 1,000, huh? And then down below, negative the cost to play, negative $1. That's what you'll lose if you, if you lose, if you don't win. And what's the probability of losing? 999 divided by 1,000. There's 999 that lose. So put that into your calculator in L1, L2, and then hit the stat, you know, the stat, calc, the one there. But you got to specifically put in L1, comma L2. Remember, whenever you have two columns of data, L1 and L2, I've been getting a lot of questions on that, so that's an important point I want to emphasize with you is you got to make sure you put in L1, comma L2. Hit the buttons and then get the X bar because it's the average, right? It's the average on that. And uh, X bar is negative 0.5. You expect to lose 50 cents on average. Is that good? Remember how to do that? So there'll be a gambling one or an insurance one on the exam. Handle it just like that. Questions on that? All right, 14. The amount of rainfall... I want to make sure... That
Um, okay, amount of rainfall in January. Certain city is normally distributed. Mean of 4.5, standard deviation 0.3. Find the value of Q1 that separates the bottom from top 75. All right, this is what we've done recently. Now we're into like last week, huh? How do we recognize that? Normally distributed. So we're talking about a bell curve. So you know how to do these. This is our recent stuff, huh? So can you draw yourself? Uh, well, we're running out of time, so let me draw for you. Remember on these, you draw a bell curve. Draw a bell curve, and we put on the bell curve the center. What's the center? And the mean, which is 4.5. And um, you're doing... We're, we're, Q1 is going to be somewhere down here, isn't it? Right? Because remember, the quarter, they break it into quarters, right? This would be like 25%, 25%. There's some Q3 up here, 25%. Right? It breaks the whole data set into four equal quarters like a football game. Right? So Q1 is right here. So then, is this one going to be a normal CDF or an inverse norm? Good. Because normal CDF they ask for an area percent or decimal, where, whereas inverse norm, they give you an area percent or decimal. And this one, they're clearly giving me an area right here. They're giving me all kinds of area, aren't they? So it's inverse norm. And so when you do inverse norm... Inverse norm, it's always area to the left, comma mean, comma standard deviation. So um, let's put that in. What is the area to the left? The left of what? The left of Q1. Yeah, because they want me to find Q1. So the area to the left of Q1 is 0.25. What's the mean? That's the 4.5. Standard deviation, that's the 0.3. Hit the buttons on the calculator. And I'm getting 4.297. So I'll round to 4.3. There it is. 4.3. All right. So there's that one, 4.3. All right, number 15. Find the indicated probability. A bank, a bank's loan officer rates applicants for credit. The ratings are normally distributed, mean 200, standard 50. Applicant is randomly selected. Probably the rating is between 200 and 275. Okay, normally distributed. Bell curve, huh? So that's, that's the signal that you're for sure looking at a bell curve problem. So let's draw another bell curve. Put the middle on there. The mean is 200. There it is. And the we're saying, what's the probability? The rating is between 200 and 275. So I'll put 200, and then I'll just put 275 over there. And they want the area between. Does that make sense? Between 200 and 275. So that's either going to be inverse norm or, or normal CDF. So normal CDF is the one where they, where they ask you for the area. They ask for the area percent or decimal. And the inverse norm is where they give you, give you the area percent or decimal. So which one? Are they giving me an area on this one? No, that would be up here if they gave me an area, like something like that, huh? They're not giving me an area, so they are asking me for an area. So it's a normal CDF, huh? So it's normal CDF. Remember how that works? Uh, what is it? Left edge, right edge? We've done this a lot recently, huh? Left edge, right edge mean standard. So normal CDF. Left edge, 200. Right edge, 275. This will be an easy one, I think. 200, 275, the mean, 200. Oh, that means the same. Yeah, the mean 200. Standard deviation, 50. Hit the buttons on the calculator.
I'm getting 0.433. Oh, it's not there. No. Is that what you all are getting? 0.433? No. So it's disturbingly none of these. But there's the answer. 0.433. Good there. Let's see. For women age 18 to 24, systolic blood pressure <coughs> in whatever units um, are normally distributed. Mean one, um, 114.8, standard deviation, if 23 women are randomly selected, find the probability, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let's lay it out. So it's another normal curve. Right, so I'm just, I'm just keying on those words, normally distributed. The mean is 114.8, so that's the middle. And we want the probability that's between... 119 and 122. So 119, I'll put that there. And 122 right there. There we go. 119, 122. Those are both to the right of 114.8, aren't they? Is that good? See, I always locate everything on the normal curve. So is this um, normal CDF or inverse norm? It's normal CDF again because... They're, at, they're not giving me an area, are they? So it's normal CDF. What do you always do for normal CDF? Left edge, right edge, mean, and standard. So let's do it. Right. So, right. so left edge is right here, 119. Right edge, right there, 122. 119 to 122. The mean is the 114.8 and the standard deviation 13.1 hit the buttons on your calculator and you'll get the wrong answer won't you yeah so what do we need to do so good I'm glad you guys are on it is everybody on it if you do this right here you'll get the, they probably put that answer there I get these off the publishers um, website so they, they make them up I promise I'm not sitting around going, ha, ha, ha. I'm just getting them off the site. They often put those in there. So um, what am I missing? <coughs> Dividing by square root. 5% warning. Dividing by square root of 23. So you've got to remember when you have a group, you've got to divide that standard deviation by the square root of the group size. Because that, remember the, remember the dice thing I showed you? How that forces them to take a group average. See, we're taking the average that they're mean, the mean, the average of the 23 women. When you take averages of numbers, the highs and the lows, the average of them, it tends to the middle, doesn't it? So that was the central limit theorem, that you push stuff to the center, meaning you make the standard deviation less. There's less spread because you push things to the center. That's why the standard deviation is divided by. It's made smaller when you have a group average. So you've got to watch out. If they'd said an individual woman, blah, 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 then I would not divide by the square root of 23. But if they say a group, so you've you got to be watching for that. It's on the exam two notes. I specifically put it in there. I said if n is greater than 1, you've got to remember to divide by the square root of n. All right. So I'm getting 0 0.057... 0.0579. Wow, that's close. See, that's what I'm saying. Wow. Is that none of these? Yeah, that's not that's just wrong. You're getting, yeah, um, like Zach is saying, if you're getting an answer super close to one of these answers, either Mr. Heron messed up again, or, because I'm not trying to trick you like that. And I'm, you know, um, so this should say 0 0.0579, which it now says in the updated in the updated quiz. Yeah, if you're getting something so close like that, double check your calculation. You know, it's not going to be like hairline off like that. No, no, you're doing it right now. Do choose the point oh five seven seven. For the people that haven't started yet, it'll it'll say oh five seven nine. There we go. All right. Um, all right. So human body temperatures are normally distributed mean ninety eight point two, standard nineteen people, probability less than ninety eight point. Five. This one's like off a little bit too, I think. All right. Yeah, it might be. Um, so let's, let's try this one. So it's going to be another normal curve. 
And the mean is 98.2. 98.2, and the, um, and what are we doing on this problem? It's saying, standard deviation, okay, 19 people, but probably less than 98.5. So 98.5 is here. It's somewhere to the right of 98.2. And they want the probability, which, which way am I going to shade? Am I going to shade to the left or to the right? Yeah, because it says, Less than. Lesser things are to the left, huh? Greater things to the right. So I want to shade all this area to the left of the 98.5 because it says less than 98.5. Good so far? So is this one uh, normal CDF or inverse norm? Normal CDF because they're asking me for the area. So that's left edge, right edge, mean, and standard. So... And is this a group or an individual? Mm -hmm. 19 people. So this standard is divided by the square root of 19, huh? So anytime you have a group, more than one person, you've got to divide that standard by the square root of 19, says the central limit theorem. You're pushing things to the center when you're taking group averages. High numbers and low numbers average in the center, don't they? You have less spread. Standard deviation is lower. All right, left edge. What is the left edge? Is it the 98.2? Yeah, remember, it's the left edge of the shading, which is way over here, which is left forever. How do we tell the calculator infinity left? Negative 99999. That's how we tell the calculator forever left, infinity left. Right? That shading goes left forever, doesn't it? So the left edge is negative 5 nines. The right edge is 98.5. Right? Here's the right edge. Here's the left edge. The mean is 98.2. The standard, uh, 0.62, but then divided by square root of 19. We all good there? 0.62 divided by the square root of 19. Okay, I'm getting 0 0.9825. 0.9825. Well, this answer has been changed on the official quiz, 9825, because it's 98253. So it doesn't round to six. Period answer, 0.9825 on that one. All right. What's this one? Oh, just a couple of these. All right. Find the area of the shaded region. So, yeah, this, these are actually easier ones. So let me make that bigger. Okay, so there's the question. There it is, bigger. Find the area of the shaded region. So is that, um, so it's bell curves, normal CDF or inverse norm? On that one, normal CDF, right, because they're not giving me the area. So normal CDF, and that'll be left edge, right edge, mean, standard. So normal CDF, left edge, right edge, mean, standard. So what's the left edge? Yeah, same old thing, huh? Negative five nines. Right edge is right here, 1 point, comma, 1.13. Mean, what's the mean? Zero. Yeah, did you catch that? Mean is zero, standard is one, huh? Remember these from the homework? I'm getting point eight seven zero eight. Yeah, it's, it's good, it turns out. So we've only had to fix three. Four. 16 and 17 so far. One more to go. Is that good? Y'all getting that okay? 8708 from this right here. 8708. One more. Okay, question 19. Find the indicated Z score. Uh, the graph, blah, 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 shaded area. Okay, so there's number 19. They want you to find the, uh, find the indicated Z score. So they want you to find, they're telling you the shaded area, this right here is 0 0.0694. So is this normal CDF or inverse norm? Inverse. This one's inverse norm, exactly, because of the fact that they're giving me an area, huh? Inverse norm, and that always is area to the left, comma mean, comma standard. So 
inverse norm. So what's now, the spot is right here. So what's the area, this is area to the left. So remember how the inverse norm function works. You give him area to the left, he tells you the spot. So we want to find this spot right here. And so we need to tell him area to the left of that spot. What is the area to the left of that spot? One minus this, huh? It's one minus point oh six nine four. Don't even worry about what it is. Just type it in just like that. Does that make sense? Because it's the opposite. It's the rest of the curve, huh? Point oh six nine four is to the right. So the amount to the left is everything else. Comma mean comma standard. Hit the buttons on your calculator. I'm getting 1.48. There it is.